Have a seat. Good morning. Glad you guys are here. Uh, if you're a guest today, my name is Trey. I'm the pastor here. And uh, thank you for joining us in the room. Thank you for joining us online. We are wrapping up our series, Waymaker, today. And uh, it's kind of fitting. Feels like we're wrapping up, hopefully, a lot of things. Like, you know, maybe we haven't really been talking about COVID or the pandemic, you know, just kind of hoping it will go away. And it kind of feels like maybe we are finally seeing some light in the tunnel, wrapping things up. And so I have a question for you about your pandemic experience, your COVID experience. Uh, I'm curious... Did any of you develop any new habits or any new uh, hobbies, any new interest during the pandemic? Uh, some people took this opportunity to, you know, lose weight and get in really good shape. I did not. I did not. I missed that moment. Um, but I did. I know a lot, of, a lot of people picked up new interests. I actually did pick up a, a new interest. It actually started prior to, to the pandemic, but... But I decided, you know, I was 40 years old, it was, it was time for me to figure this thing out. And I started trying to learn the stock market um, just because I knew nothing, nothing about, about the stock market. market. I knew it was a market with stocks. I didn't really know how it worked. And I um, turned 40, and I was like, you know what, I should, I should at least have a rudimentary understanding of what this thing is. And so I have some really good friends in my life who understand it very well. And they, you know, they were very patient with me. They started explaining it to me, and they pointed me towards some books, some articles. I started watching the financial news. And uh, I understand it a little bit. I'm not saying I understand it completely. Do not ask me for financial advice, for stock advice, because I won't give you any. But, but I understand it because at the end of the day, it's pretty logical. It really is. Good companies with good leadership, good products, over time, tend to do better, and they're the ones you should invest in. I've also learned when you see companies go up and it's not logical, you run from those companies as fast as humanly possible because other stuff is going on, like Internet boards are involved, and you just don't want any part of that whatsoever. But as I was studying and I was learning, I found myself falling into a pretty common trap for people who start studying the stock market. And it took several people to remind me that, that I couldn't just trust what I was looking at because a company can do well. Let's say a company has grown and their stock has gone up 10% a year for the last 10 years. So the logical assumption would be if it's gone up 10% a year for the last 10 years, it's going to continue to go up 10% a year for the next 10 years because that's what logic teaches us. But the second you start studying the stock market, man, everybody's like, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to look at the past, but you can't use that to predict the future because things change. Markets change. Companies change. Leadership can change. A new product could come in. They could release a bad product. They could lose market share. And so while it would be supernatural and understandable to say, hey, this company's done this over the last 10 years. I can trust it's going to keep doing it. If you've ever studied stocks, if you're involved in the financial world at all, you know where I'm going. There is something that they say. Anytime they talk about stocks, because honestly, the only thing you can study is the past. But anytime you talk about stocks and their previous performance, there is a phrase that they use. There's a phrase that they say in financial commercials. There's a phrase that they put at the bottom of a prospectus. There's a phrase that if you were a financial advisor, you have probably said it so many times that you know exactly where I'm going. And the phrase is this, past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Now, if you've ever listened to a commercial for a stock, they say it this way, past performance is not a guarantee of future results. They say it very fast. We've grown 10% a year for the last five years. Past performance, not a guarantee of future results. Like, focus on the fun part. Don't worry about that whole part about what we've done in the past has no bearing on what the future is going to look like. And so for someone new to stocks, like, you really have to understand that. Because you could go and you could look at this company and be like, oh, I'm definitely going to buy this company because they've done this, this, and this. Not knowing, well, they've just changed CEOs. And... They've just used all their cash on a product that didn't work. So you have to understand other things because past performance in the financial world is not a guarantee of future results. And I was thinking about this. It occurred to me that this statement, past performance is not a guarantee of future results, is true beyond the financial sector. It's pretty much true in our relationships. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. And I think we all kind of inherently understand this. Just because someone has never lied to you doesn't mean they'll never lie to you. Just because someone has never betrayed you, it doesn't mean that they'll never betray you. 
And so we tend to go through life trusting experience, gathering experience, but always understanding experience isn't enough. We have to keep our eyes forward. We have to keep our eyes looking because past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Just because it's been good in the past does not mean it will be good in the future. And again, in most cases, this is a really healthy lesson to learn. Hopefully it doesn't build cynicism, but it just creates a healthy caution in every area of life. Now, I'll bring this up because there is one relationship. There is one person that this statement is fundamentally absolutely untrue. And the problem is me and you and all of us sometimes get confused who the statement applies to and who it shouldn't. And so as we wrap up our series Waymaker today, I want to take, to take you and talk to you about the one person in your life and the one person in my life and the one person in all our lives where this statement does not apply. Now, as we said earlier, if you're new, you missed some of our series, hope you grab our app. It's a great way to stay connected. Also, you can go back because this is week six of Waymaker. We've been in this series now, and we've been studying a group of people called the Nation of Israel. They were God's chosen people to execute phase one of his rescue plan for humanity. We've been studying the Nation of Israel as they have pursued the promise God has given them of a new home. He delivered them from captivity in Egypt, and today they are actually going to take the promised land. They are going to walk into that promise. Now, if you were here last week, you saw this same group of people miss their promise. And it was because they were afraid. They got right to the precipice of the moment. They got right to the door, and then they became fearful that God wasn't going to provide. And the reason they were afraid, I'm convinced, is because they had experienced this statement. They had experienced that past performance is not a guarantee of future results. They had experienced that sometimes people let you down. They had experienced that just because someone was there for you in the past, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be there for you now. And they took that experience and they applied it to their God. They said, yes, God delivered us from Egypt. Yes, God took us across the Red Sea. Yes, God provided us manna. But past performance is not a guarantee of future results. I've experienced that in my life. And so, yes, God's done this before, but I'm not sure I can trust him here and now. I'm not sure I can trust him with this experience. Now, if you were here last week, you know we talked about this, but that's fundamentally not true. Here's what we said last week. We said, no, 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 God's provision in the past is proof he'll provide again. It is proof. And so to kind of put a bow on it today, here's how we're going to say the fundamental bottom line, not just of today but of this entire series, is this. God's past performance is a guarantee of future results because he is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Now, please hear me. That does not mean he is always going to move the same way. It doesn't mean he's always going to do the exact same thing. It just means he's the same God. And he is always at work for his glory and our good. Always. Which means the more time we spend studying his past performance, the more confidence we have in the present and the more hope we have for the future. Because he is the same God. In fact, that has been the entire point of this Waymaker series. Is to give us confidence in the present when we can't see what God is doing. When we don't understand what's happening. We get confidence in the present by studying the performance of the past. And then, because we have confidence in the present, we have hope for the future. Because God promised the nation of Israel a new land, and today he leads them into that new land. And as he leads them into that new land, this is why we're looking at this story, he gives them a step. One thing that he wants them to do in that moment as they enter their promise. And it is that one step that I'm going to challenge all of us in this room to take as well. Because that step is what allows us to remember what God's done previously. And it's that step that we can turn to when we don't see God. We don't understand what he's doing. And that step that provides the proof and the confidence we need in the moments of uncertainty. 
So I want to dive right into the story today. As I said, the nation of Israel is about to enter the promised land. Now, some things have changed since we last um, read about the nation of Israel. We have now moved 40 years into the future. 40 years. Because God didn't permit any of the men and women, 18 or older, who rejected his promise to enter the promised land. And as we said last week, God doesn't work that way anymore, but fear can still keep us from his promises. Now, a man named Joshua is the leader of the nation of Israel. Moses has passed away. God has passed his, his baton to Joshua. And Joshua is about to lead the people in to the nation of Israel to enter to, 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 to the promised land. To enter the promised land, they have to cross a river. It's called the Jordan River. And so God, in preparation for what's to come, because they're about to go take a land. They're about to go conquer nations. They need confidence to do that. It was fear that kept their uh, ancestors from that promise. And so God decides to give them proof of his power as they cross in to the nation of Israel. And he does this by stopping the Jordan River from flowing so that they can walk across on dry land. He tells Joshua to have the priests carry something called the Ark of the Covenant. Have you ever seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? That's what they're talking about. It's the Ark of the Covenant. It was this box that God had had the nation of Israel create, and it carried proof of the covenant he had made with the nation of Israel. And so these priests load up this big box on their shoulders, and they march into the Jordan River. And right as they get to the center of the Jordan River, the river stops. God literally blocks it upstream. It dries out. And the nation of Israel begins walking across on dry land. Because he wanted to have this final picture of his power before they went in to receive new promises that he was giving them. And it's as they have crossed the Jordan, as the last person steps across, that God steps in and says, okay, wait, 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 wait. Before you move on, before you go do something else, we're going to pause for a minute. Because there's a new practice I want to teach you. And here's what he says. When all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, now choose 12 men, one from each tribe. Hey, Joshua, before we move on, before we go do something else, I want you to tell the tribes, each of you pick one person. And here's what I want them to do. He says, I want you to take them, tell them to take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up at the place where you will camp tonight. He says, hey, Joshua, before we move past this moment, I want you to go, I want you to pick 12 men, and I want them each to go pick a stone from the very place where where the, the priests are standing. Go pick a reminder. Go pick a memento from that place. And I'm sure they're all like, What? But God, this is the new land. We want to go. We're we're, we're forward thinking. We're moving forward. Why would we go back? And he's like, because I need you to pause for a moment. Because I just stopped water from flowing. You just walked across a river on dry land. That was a miracle. Don't miss the moment. See, I'm guilty of that. In my life, I am guilty of praying and hoping and wishing that God would do something amazing. And the second he does it, I'm like, sweet, what's next? And I never take time in that moment to pick up a stone. I never take time in that moment to say, whoa, did you guys see that? God just moved. God just performed a miracle. God just did something amazing. And so what Joshua is doing on behalf of his heavenly father is saying, not on my watch. Not this group, not this nation, not these people. We're going to pause for a moment and we're going to remember. We're going to take proof. We're going to take a memento. And here's what they're going to do with them. We will use these stones to build a memorial. See, we're going to take proof of the miracle. And we're going to take it with us, and we're going to build ourselves a memorial so that we can always look at it and we can always remember what God did. And that's exactly what they did. They took the stones, they built the memorial, and as if after it was built, Joshua explained to them and to us the power in that moment. Here's what he said. He said, then Joshua said to the Israelites, in the future, your children will ask, 
What do these stones mean? See, eventually there's going to be people around that don't know the significance of the stones. They don't know the significance of the memorial. And they're going to ask you, what is this? Why would you build this? Why do you have this? It could be your kids. It could be friends. It could be new, uh, future generations. They're going to ask, what is the significance of this? And Joshua says, then you can tell them. Well, this is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. So I said, what is this? Oh, sweetie, come here. Let me explain it to you. You won't believe this day. We, were, we had waited 40 years for this promise from our Heavenly Father. The land was just on the other side, but we had to cross this river. And our God stopped the water. He stopped it so that we could walk across on dry ground. See, the power of that memorial, and don't miss this, the power of that memorial was regardless of their current circumstances, they could always go back and find previous proof of God's provision. Anytime they wondered, is God still for me? Is God still with me? I hadn't heard from him in a while. I'm not sure he's really here. They could always go back to those 12 stones and say, I'm not sure what you're up to now, God, but I know what you were up to on this day. I remember it. I was there. I experienced it. You moved. See, there's power in memorials. Not just for that moment. Watch this. Joshua keeps going. He says, for the Lord God dried up the river right before your eyes, and he kept it dry until you were all across, just as he did at the Red Sea, where he dried it up until we had all crossed over. See, memorials remind us of God's previous provision as well, because as they were sitting there, Joshua was like, hey, remember God did this already once before. That's how God's so cool. God literally parts water to free the Israelites from captivity to begin the pursuit of their promise. God literally parts water as they walk into their promise. Same God. See, he was rhyming there. He was saying, you probably heard your parents or your grandparents talk about that moment at the Red Sea. I'm the same God yesterday and today and forever. I did it for them, and I'm going to do it for you. And also, watch this. He did this so that all the nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful, and so you might fear the Lord your God forever. He said, see, he also did this by memorializing this. It's not just for you. It's not just for your friends. It's not just for your family. It's not even just for your people you like. It's for the world. It's for people you haven't met yet. This physical, tangible reminder of a move of God is going to draw people to him that don't even know him yet. So Joshua's saying, guys, 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 I know we're excited. We are home. God has delivered. But before we move on, before that, we're just going to take a moment. And we're going to take a step to remember what's happened here. To declare for ourselves and for all nations for all times that God moved here. Why? We know why. Because God's past performance is a guarantee of future results. He moved here before, same God. So I bet he'll move again. So Joshua urges them to take a step. When we're done today, I'm going to urge you to take the same step. To spend some time this week thinking about a time in your life where you know because you know because you know God moved. And to take a step to memorialize it. And you may wonder why. Why does this matter? Why was it important for them? Why is it important for us? Well, you understand it in every other area of your life. We just don't always do it with the God of the universe. Because here's what we understand. To clearly remember, we must properly memorialize. This is why you took 8,000 pictures of your first child. I say first child because if you've had a couple, you know the pictures get less. Sorry, they just do. Because we understand to clearly remember we must properly memorialize. We didn't need 35 pictures of the bath. One was good enough, right? But we understand this. To clearly remember, we must properly memorialize. It's why we take pictures. It's why you have wedding albums. It's why we have graduation photos. It's why we have senior pictures. 
It's why we have all the pictures of all the sporting events and all the things. Because we understand, to clearly remember, we must properly memorialize. Because if we don't memorialize, if we don't take pictures, we will forget. Our memory will get cloudy. Was it really then? Was it there? Is this what happened? I don't know. So we take pictures. We start mommy blogs. We use social media as literally just a space where we plant memories because we know the Internet is written in ink and it ain't going anywhere. And so we take these steps in every other area of our lives because we inherently understand if I want to remember this, I've got to memorialize it. That's why we have memorabilia. It's why we keep ticket stubs. It's why we have T-shirts that we won't throw away, even though maybe our spouse wants us to throw them away. And it's like, no, but you don't get what this, 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 this T-shirt is a memory. Physical, tangible memories that we can turn to. We do this in every other area of our lives, except with our Heavenly Father. Which is why Joshua says, hey, do this now. This is important. Because here's what happens when we memorialize what God's done. Memorials build faith. Remember I said last week, faith's built on facts. Is what I was trying to create for you. The memorials of your life where God has moved are facts in your life. They are factual events you can return to and say, yep, God moved there. Yep, I experienced that. You will never believe it. So we have to take steps to memorialize what God's done in our lives. And I know the word memorial, like you're thinking, you know, like does it need to be in stone? Do we need to create a shrine or something? And so here's what I want to do. I want to share with you some personal memorials from my life. I want to share with you some, some things I've kept over the years that, I, that help me remember who God is and what God's done. And then I'm going to give you some simple principles that you can apply to your lives. And then I'm going to challenge you this week to spend some time alone or with your friends, with your family, with a spouse. And just reflect and create one memorial. Not, not five, not ten, just one. Just take a step this week to memorialize one moment in time that you know because you know because you know because you know. God showed up and he moved. So let me share some of mine. Here's the first one. I think I've actually shared this one before. This is a ticket stub to a movie. It is dated March 3rd, 2002. This is the ticket stub from the very first time Danielle and I hung out. I say hung out because if you look at the bottom of the stub, it has her name on it. She paid for her own ticket. <laughs> yeah, I was a catch. No, honestly, I was intimidated. I never thought she'd go out on a date with me. And so a group of us uh, went and because I'm a gentleman, I let her buy her own ticket. Um, she gave this to me a couple years ago. I don't remember when you gave it to me. But it sits in this frame. It sits beside my bed. And to me, it is a reminder of the overwhelming goodness of God. Because, not just because she's amazing, even though she is. Um, I've shared this story before. Before I met my wife, um, I was actually engaged before to, an, to another young lady, and she ended it. And at the time, man, I thought my life was over, and I was very, very, very angry with God. Very angry. I questioned my faith. I couldn't wrap my brain around if God loved me, how he could allow that happen to me. And then I went to the movies with Danny Teal. And I was like, I get it now. I get it now. And so here's the power of this memorial. Now I have tangible proof when God doesn't do what I want him to do. When I feel like I'm missing something, when I feel like I didn't get what I wanted, when I feel like God's let me down, I have proof. Yeah, you may feel let down in this moment, and that's okay. Come to me, turn to me, but I'm at work for my glory and your good. So just keep trusting me, and it'll turn out good. I have another one. 
This is a church bulletin. How many of you are familiar with church bulletins? Do you remember these? Now, this is like, this is, this is a legit church bulletin. I mean, it's trifold. This is from my church growing up, First Baptist Church, Florence, South Carolina. They would literally tell you in advance the songs they were going to sing. Would that be nice? Um, we're not going to do this, by the way. It costs too much money. Um, but this bulletin is dated October 26, 1997. Because this is the day that I shared with my church and the world and went public with the fact that God had called me to full-time Christian ministry. And I will never forget this day as long as I live. I had met with several people. I would met with a senior pastor. I would wrestled and I would wrestled and I would wrestled. Um, and on this day, I planted the flag in the ground. I said, God, you've called me to this. And I don't understand it. I definitely had my own plans, but you've called me to this moment. And I wish I could say I've never looked back, but I've looked back many, many times. I keep this on my desk at home where I write. I didn't keep this. My mom actually kept it. And she gave it to me years ago. In the first few years of Wellspring, man, it was rough. It didn't quite work as fast as I wanted it to work. It wasn't the overnight success I had dreamt about. But I had this, and I could remember that moment. And I knew, man, God, God's with me. God's called me to this. He's been with me. He's going to keep, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I knew I've never been as sure of anything in my life as I was on this day. And so I have proof that God spoke, God moved, and when I can't hear him currently, I, I'm reminded that he's moved before. But all my memorials aren't even things. Um, there's a song. And if you've been around Wellspring for a long time, you may know this story, but there's a song that always bringing me right back to a moment in time where God moved. Um, it was June of 2008, and we were living in Fort Worth, Texas, and it was the day Danielle and I were going to move back to Myrtle Beach to start Wellspring. Uh, we had two kids at the time. Uh, Jacob was not born, and David and John were both super young. And we woke up the morning. We were all packed up, ready to go. We woke up, and they were both sick. And I don't mean sniffle sick, I mean mm, sick, you know. They were sick. So the last person we saw in Dallas-Fort Worth was our pediatrician. And because I'm such a servant, I had put all the furniture in my car, so I was driving alone with all the furniture packed around me, and my wife and my mother and our two kids were in her car. I was just trying to be nice. I didn't know they'd get sick, by the way. But... The pediatrician gave us medicine. The medicine did not work, and so they continued to get sick, and they continued to get sick, and I was racing someone, so I was like, we're not stopping, you know, the whole dad race thing. I was just going, and so eventually, we're almost out of Texas. We're in Longview, Texas, and I get a phone call, and Danielle's like, we have to stop, and I'm like, no, 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 no. We, we got to keep going. Okay. She goes, David just took off his shoe and threw it at us and said, no more driving, we have to stop. I said, okay, we'll stop. And so I look for an exit, and I find one, and we pull off, and we pull into right off the exit. There is a Kentaco hut. If you're not familiar with a Kentaco hut, that's Kentucky Fried Chicken, Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, Combo. Remember when all three of those used to be in the same restaurant? Just like a cacophony of death, you know. That's what it was. Um, it was a Kentaco hut. And we pull off, and we all got out of the car. We were not speaking. My mom won't make eye contact with me. The kids are miserable. And at this point, I'm just pretty frustrated. I'm like, God, what are you doing? What? Seriously, bro? I'm like, you get what we're doing, right? We, we're selling our house. We're leaving all our friends in Texas. We're leaving a church we love. We're doing all this to move to Myrtle Beach where we know one person, and we're doing this for you. Really? And we're just going to get sick all the time. Like, what is happening? So we were all pretty frustrated. We are all pretty down. We were all pretty upset. And 
This is how bad it was. We walked into the Kentaco hut. We did not even get in line for food. We just went and sat in the booth. We just sat there, and we all just looked miserable. No one was looking at each other, and I'm just like, man, I made a huge mistake. You know, will Keystone take me back? Can I just turn around? We didn't know what was going on. I was like, God has, God has forgotten us. God has abandoned us. And so as we're sitting there, and I'm feeling terrible for myself, and I'm doubting God, and I'm questioning, and none of us have any idea what's going on. A song comes on over the speakers in the Kentaco hut in Longview, Texas. And this was the song. Myrtle Beach days will have some fun in the waves. I don't care what the West Coast I couldn't says, believe it. I don't think they knew this song existed in Longview, Texas. I thought you only knew that song if you grew up in South Carolina. But it was playing in a Kentaco hut in Longview, Texas. And we heard it, and we looked at each other. We were like, did that just happen? Yep. And we just started laughing. We're like, all right, God. It was just this little moment. Man, I haven't forgotten you. Are you kidding me? We're gonna, I mean, you're going to experience more than you could possibly imagine. And every time I hear that song, it, it takes me back to that moment of utter despair, utter frustration when God reached through the known universe and had them play Myrtle Beach Days in Longview, Texas. I'm still not convinced anyone heard that song except us. But we all heard it. We were looking. We are like, you, you, you hear this too, right? It's not just me. It's not, we're, not, we're not crazy, right? No. No, and so if you've been around our church for a long time, you've probably heard me tell that story before because to clearly remember, we must properly memorialize. And I want to clearly remember that moment. I want, to, I want to remember what God was doing and how I felt and how wrong I was and how good God was in my wrongness. And I'll be honest, some of the best memorials I have now, some of the things I turn to and really, really help settle me when I have questions, they're you. They're the change I see in your life. They're the stories I hear of the life change in your life. When you, when you write us an email, when you share a video of how God's moving in your life, when you get baptized, when you sign your name on the, on the rescue wall, when you, when you take those steps, those physical, tangible reminders of what God's done. See, when you record a life change story, we give you a copy of it. It means you can press play whenever you want. And remember, oh, I did used to like her. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did used to enjoy that relationship. I did used to like God. I did used to enjoy serving. I did used to do those things. That's right. See, we memorialize those so that we can remember specific moments where we know because we know because we know that God moved. So how can you do that in your life? Let me give you a couple of quick tips and we're done. A good memorial, first of all, is going to be personal. It's got to have something that means something to you. This, this bulletin means nothing to you. If you had this bulletin, you would just throw it away. This bulletin means something to me. So a good memorial has to be personal to you and what happened in that moment. Also, a good memorial is powerful. It should memorialize a powerful moment. Again, we do this naturally. It's why we memorialize births. It's why we memorialize graduations. It's why we memorialize weddings. Those are significant. Those are powerful moments. A couple of ideas. Some people actually know the day they became a Christian. They know the date. And they celebrate that date as their spiritual birthday. Maybe you've been baptized. Maybe you have a picture of when you were baptized. And you could put it somewhere to remind yourself of how you felt in that moment. Maybe you prayed for God to, to move in a certain way. And maybe you prayed for a healing. Maybe you prayed for a breakthrough. Maybe you prayed for an addiction to be healed. Maybe you prayed for a relationship to, to, be, to be reconciled. Whatever it is you've prayed for, you've asked God for, and you know because you know because you know, hey, man, God moved in that moment. God moved, God was there, and God did something. God made a way. Those are the moments that we want to remember. A good memorial is also practical. These are small, man. These are super easy to, to carry. There's a reason God told the nation of Israel to pick up stones. He didn't tell them to keep the water because there's no way they could have kept the water. 
So it's got to be practical. It's got to be something easy for you to, 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 to hold. That's why I'm saying something on your phone, something you can put up in your, in your car, in your room. Just something very practical and simple that reminds you of a moment. And a good memorial is also preachable, meaning it gives you the opportunity to answer the question, why do you keep this? Why do you have this? What is this? And it's your opportunity to say, I'll tell you what this is. This is a reminder of the moment God came through in a way bigger than I ever imagined possible. And I'd love to tell you about it. So that's my challenge. To spend some time this week reflecting on how God came through and then choose to take a step to remember, because here's what we understand, to clearly remember we must properly memorialize. We get this in every other area of our lives. We we totally understand it. So the challenge is to just open it up a little bit more and to begin memorialize what God's done in your life. Because to understand what God's done is more powerful than to understand what anyone else has done. Because God's past performance is a guarantee of future results. To memorialize moments where you know God moved is to build your faith. It is to give you factual anchors to turn to in moments of confusion because you will have them. There will be times you don't know what God is doing. There will be times you don't feel like God is moving. And in those times, his invitation is trust me, but not blind trust. Trust me based on the facts of your life. Trust me based on what you have experienced. Turn back. Look what I've done before. I'm that same God. I don't know some of you are thinking, man, I don't know that I have any. I don't know that God's done anything that big in my life, done anything that major in my life. If that's you, I understand. Then I'd invite you to come back tonight. Because tonight when we gather for night of worship, we take what we call communion, which is the Lord's Supper, which might be the most powerful reminder in human history. Because as we eat the bread and we drink the juice, we are reminded of the greatest thing that ever happened in human history, that the God of the universe loved us so much he sacrificed his son so he could have a relationship with us. And that the God of the universe was so powerful he could raise the dead. And he wants to have a relationship with us. And so if you don't have a memorial, that's fine. Recognize the one Jesus instituted on the night he was arrested. Because it is a reminder of who God is. It is a reminder of what he's done. And it is an invitation to all of us to place our trust in the God that never changes. So this week, take a step. Create a memorial and let it remind you that your God never changes. He was with you and is with you. He moved before and you can trust He will move again. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we love you so much. God, we are just so thankful for your truth. We're so thankful for your unchanging ways. Father, I pray right now that you bring to mind ways you've moved in the past. God, I pray you give us the the courage and the ability to take some time this week to memorialize those moments. May we clearly remember. And may that memory become the facts that build the foundations of our faith foundations that are unshaking even in murky circumstances even when we can't see may we have an anchor a foundation of a life lived with you a foundation of a book filled with stories of you moving over millennia different people different circumstances different lives same God we thank you that you are always at work for your glory and our good May we take steps this week to remind ourselves of that truth. We love you. It's in your son's amazing holy name we pray.